and welcome back! It's October, the ghastliest and gruesomest month of the year. The time of the year when some people finally have the excuse they need to dress as slutty as they wish they could on any other day of the year. Not me, though. I would never do that. Anyhow, I have a new project. Whoa, 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 whoa. Don't go. It gets better. I promise. Though it may look like a generic 1980s consumer product, the kind with a blinking display that cruelly mocks anyone who's ever tried to set the time through a series of unintuitive key presses only to have it revert back to its blinking state when you trip a breaker in the garage doing a questionable electrical experiments, this device mocks us in a different way. This device mocks us by reminding us that our precious lives are perilously short. say this is not a build video. Well, because it took me seven months to finish it. Because I have ADHD or something and I can't focus on one project at a time to save my life. Sometime last winter, some friends of a friend gave me a Canon camcorder VCR, VCR timer tuner combo from, uh, I think, 1980. I couldn't get it all working again, so I decided to do a teardown instead. While I was tearing down the timer tuner, my friend Roger took note of the display, which showed things like time and day and you know, stuff for setting the timer tuner to come on at the right time to record whatever show you wanted to record. The display was a vacuum fluorescent display. You've probably seen them in some older consumer products. Um, maybe your microwave. Some, some microwaves have these things. Uh, even some alarm clocks have them. Roger wanted to know what it would take to run that display if we removed it from the timer tuner. I wasn't really sure. All I knew about vacuum fluorescent displays at the time was that they had, they were kind of like a vacuum tube and they required some relatively high voltages to run. Uh, and that was about it. So over the next couple of weeks at the hacker group we attend, we sort of cobbled together a power supply that let us get some of the individual digits in the thing to turn on. And that process sort of evolved from there. Um, our power supply, which had consisted of a battery and a, a power supply from a, uh, uh, some kind of printer, I don't remember what kind, and um, part of the power supply from the timer tuner, it was like kind of all cobbled together, but it evolved and it got more elaborate and it got more sophisticated. And uh, Roger felt inspired by the progress we had made and he thought it might be fun to build an actual system that could control this display. So over the course of several months, that experimentation eventually evolved into the death clock. Really the, the concept of the death clock solidified when I went on Twitter and asked people what I should do with the display. And um, everyone said, make a clock. They said, make a clock, make a clock, make a clock. And I said, no, there's already plenty of vacuum fluorescent display clocks. We don't need another vacuum fluorescent display clock. And they said, make a clock, make a clock, make a clock, make a clock. And I was like, all right, you assholes. Like, I'm gonna make a clock, but this is gonna be one of those monkey's paw things where like, you're gonna get your wish, but it's not gonna be, it's not gonna turn out the way you wanted. And so, kind of out of spite, <laughs> uh, this might be my first project I've ever done out of spite. Uh, out of spite, I decided to make a clock that tells you when you're gonna die. We can have this thing uh, tell people, like, just pick a day randomly. Just pick a day and pick a time. And so, when they use the clock, it'll tell them what day of the week they're gonna die and at what time. So. For those of you who are not familiar with vacuum fluorescent display, despite how they look, they're really not so different than an old school vacuum tube. Let me explain. They're similar to vacuum tubes. In fact, they are a vacuum tube. Um, specifically, they are a triode, um, which means that there's three terminals inside of it. There's the filament, which gets heated up by an alternating current to release electrons. These electrons are pulled towards the plate, which is charged oppositely from them. In a typical vacuum tube, when those electrons were to strike the plate, which is the anode, they'd continue on to whatever circuitry the vacuum tube is attached to. But in a vacuum fluorescent display, the anode is coated in a phosphorescent material that lights up when it's struck by electrons. So, with just the anode and the cathode, 
you already have a vacuum tube that sort of acts as a crude display, right? You can make part of it light up. But what's missing is control. Control is provided by the grid. The grid is sort of like a gatekeeper. It sits in between the anode and the cathode, and it either lets electrons pass through or it blocks them. If it's charged positively, the electrons are essentially welcome through. They get pulled just like they get pulled towards the plate because they're negative and the grid is positive. So they get pulled towards it and then they just sort of shoot right through because it's like a screen and they keep going. But if the grid does not have a positive charge, then they're blocked and they can't continue on. So with those three parts, you can now turn glowing segments on and off with a pretty good level of control. Now, in an actual vacuum fluorescent display, you have several grids and you have actually quite a few plates. And so by turning on combinations of grid and plates, you can light up specific segments within the display. Because of the vacuum tube nature of a VFD, they need relatively high voltages to operate, around 30 to 60 volts. Not as high a voltage as a vacuum tube that would be used for amplification, but relatively high nonetheless. That's quite a bit higher than you'd need for a like an LCD or an LED panel, but considerably less than you would need for running a Nixon tube. In creating this project, I wanted to capture some of the essence of 1980s alarm clocks. Many clocks of that era followed a sort of common design language. You had the display, which was a digital display that typically was based on LEDs or a VFD. Uh, there was a black plastic case, uh, sometimes textured, and then you had like a faux wood wrap or a vinyl decal or some kind of faux wood, usually looking like walnut. So I decided I wanted to combine those three elements. I wanted the display to go with a like a black case and some wood. But I decided to go upscale a little bit. Um, so I went with a metal case and I went with real wood. Um, and ultimately, I think the final result kind of looks like a combination of that 1980s alarm clock aesthetic and like a 1970s uh, stereo hi-fi aesthetic. The final design, I think, combines some of that 1980s alarm clock aesthetic with also some of the looks that you'd find in a 1970s hi-fi system. And I quite like it. I'm going to open this thing up now and show you some of the inner workings. Okay, so this is the insides of the death cloth. And um, looking in here, you'll see a few things. I'm gonna kind of break this up into subunits while I explain. So um, back here we have the power supply. And this is mostly salvaged out of that original VCR timer tuner. Um, power cord came from the VCR timer tuner. This transformer was the primary power supply out of that thing. Um, and it has several windings that come off that supply different AC voltages. And um, I have used three out of the four windings. So these two gray wires here, these are providing two and a half volts alternating current. And those are wired directly to the VFD display, which is up here. And what that winding is doing is providing the current to heat the filament. Because as I mentioned previously in this video, the filament needs to be heated so it releases electrons. Um, one of these windings provided like 24 volts alternating current, and I put it through the bridge rectifier and then through a smoothing capacitor. And once it comes out of the smoothing capacitor, we end up with about 30 volts DC. And that's being used to provide the voltage to drive the VFD itself. So we have the plate at about 30 volts in comparison to the filament. The other winding which I believe was coming out around like 18 volts AC is also getting rectified. And once it gets rectified and smooth, it's around 24 volts, maybe, I don't know, 22 volts uh, DC. And it's going right into this little boost converter here. And this boost converter drops that to five volts DC. And that takes us into the next subunit, which is the control portion of the death clock. And um, so that five volts, is powering a Raspberry Pi 0W, which sits down here, and it's powering this board that you see here, this big board. And this big board here, which is sort of like a homemade Raspberry Pi hat, 
was created by Roger. And the primary workhorse of this board is this pick processor here, which is taking input from the Raspberry Pi and processing it, and then sending it out to this demultiplexer chip that you can see right there. And we're using a demultiplexer chip because the pick does not have enough uh, I.O. pins to control all the grids and uh, segments that are in this vacuum fluorescent display. So by using the demultiplexer chip, we're able to use relatively few number of pins here to control a lot of uh, subunits over here. The uh, demultiplexer chip is sending its uh, outputs to three chips that are sitting up here at the front. And these things are Darlington arrays. Uh, so like each one has like seven Darlington transistors in there. These two chips, the PIC and the demultiplexer chip, can't handle the 30 volts that this VFD needs to run. But these Darlington array chips can. And so they're just acting like switches to turn that 30 volts on to the various grids and segments as needed. And then this mess of wiring just goes up here to the front. This little glass ampule does not play a functional role. It's just purely for aesthetics. It is something made by my friend Sean. He has some glass blowing equipment and he makes these little faux vacuum tubes that have an orange LED inside uh, and a 3D printed base. And I just put it in there because I thought it gave the uh, death clock a nice ambiance because when the lid is on, you get an orange glow in there. And uh, over here, this is our sensor. This is a uh, capacitive touch sensor that I got from Adafruit. You can get these from just about anywhere. Um, and that thing is wired up to the little button here on the front. There's no real magic going on in the code on the Raspberry Pi. It's a pretty simple program. Um, I mean, it's not that simple for me because I suck at coding, but um, it's pretty simple for people who know how to code. Um, the Pi is just kind of sitting and waiting. It runs through a loop that displays things on the display, uh, and it's just waiting for that input from the capacitive touch sensor. And as soon as it gets the input, it picks randomly a day of the week, AM or PM, and then an hour and minute, and then it sends them out to the display. Roger wrote most of the code. I made some modifications to tweak it to my liking, and my wonderful friend Stein helped me with a few things that I got stuck on. So when the clock is not actually displaying death time, it goes through this routine here that is meant to attract attention. And so a passerby might see this message. It says, find your fate, tap the ball, and this little ball here, this little silver ball, is hooked up to that capacitive touch sensor. So when you touch it, it goes into its death clock mode. Release. And it looks like this time I'm gonna die at 7.42 a.m. on Saturday. And this will be different every single time you use it. And then it's very courteous and it tells them to have a nice day. So that's it. Uh, I hope you all have a happy Halloween and I really hope to see some of you at Supercon next month. Bye!